So, hello everybody. Um, welcome to our webinar. Um, I'm Logan Reyes. I'll be your host speaker for today's presentation on uh, medical device security for protecting uh, patient health and data. <clears throat> I want to thank all the volunteers at CSMP for all the support and great work that they provide to everybody. Um, they're always open to talk to and I'm grateful to be a part of it. So, let's get started. You know, as an introduction, uh, cybersecurity nonprofit pr uh, provides free cybersecurity education and promotes diversity. So uh, here's some of our uh, social media accounts if you'd like to check us out. So if you want to write it down, I'll give you a couple of seconds. So uh, let me introduce myself. Um, again, my name is Logan Reyes. I'm the uh, New Jersey chapter lead, a part of the tri-state chapter for CSMP. I am currently pursuing my bachelor's in IT while also interning for security at a medical device organization. Um, so here's a background of some capture the flag security competitions I have particip participated in, uh, which have helped me uh, become more comfortable with security. So uh, feel free to check these out if you wanna get more involved in the security community, especially Cyber Patriot, if um, you or someone you know are K through 12, I highly recommend it. And also please connect to me on LinkedIn. Um, I always like to network with new people, especially in the security industry. Uh, LinkedIn is a powerful networking platform that you should definitely consider downloading if, you, uh, trying to, if you're trying to uh, jumpstart your career. And also if you or a friend are located in the tri-state area of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, then join the CSMP tri-state chapter. Here's our discord where I plan to communicate with local members. Um, I'll make sure to post the link at the end of the uh, webinar. So, yep, our chapter is actually planning a 24-hour beginner-friendly capture, uh, capture the Flag event for February. And uh, for some background, a CTF is a uh, security competition that allows teams to compete against each other to uh, finish challenges. This includes identifying and resolving provided vulnerabilities. For example, a challenge could be to list the amount of open ports on a network in order to secure it. So that's just one example, and participating in uh, CTFs are a great way to get your foot in the security door. So make sure to keep in touch with me if that sounds intriguing. Okay, so let's go through tonight's agenda. We're going to start off with a device hack demo during a medical emergency. We will also cover why this presentation is so important in today's world. We'll introduce what exactly is IoT. We'll talk about medical devices, medical device security uh, history and encryption. We'll look at ransomware and medical uh, treatment centers like hospitals or retirement homes. FDA, HIPAA, and AAMI, uh, how different organizations and standards uh, affect medical device security. We will go through uh, security and safety risk assessments and why they are essential to the industry. And we will also go through a, what a, net, a network can look like through a hacker's eyes um, and you know, methods of security testing. And lastly, um, CSMP's US uh, West Coast Director, David Lee, will uh, be joining me to answer any questions that you might have, you may have. So, and we'll wrap up after that. So let's get it started. So as I mentioned, we're going to watch a uh, three minute video of a uh, simulated cyber attack during a medical emergency for, uh, from RSA conference. Take note to um, how the doctor responds to the incident and how uh, and consider how problematic this could be on a large scale for saving patients. So let's get this video running. Hacking healthcare. Um, if you're not familiar with this, uh, we're, we're deeply concerned, and I'm the calendar of the intersection of where bits and bytes meet flesh and blood. For several years, we grew increasingly concerned about that our dependence on connected technology was growing much faster than our ability to secure it. It's amazing what we can do with these connected systems, but truly, as Josh was saying, we've been advancing a little bit farther than we've been securing. Our estimate is 85% of the hospitals in the U.S lack a single security person on staff. So what you're gonna to see today is a clinical simulation is actually based on the work of security researchers who have demonstrated vulnerabilities in the laboratory setting um, 
It's going to feature a patient who presents with a medical problem and they're going to experience a course of events that is correlated with real actual pathophysiology. In just a little bit, we are about to bring out a physician who we are gonna have run this simulation with us. She has agreed to participate in this exercise knowing that she's going to be asked to take care of a patient, but as far as the subject of this is something that she is not aware of. So this is Bo. Um, he's been having chest pain intermittent for about uh, the last week. All right, let's give him 20 of Cardizem. All right, we're gonna be giving you some medicine continuously through your, your IV, okay? This should really get you feeling better. Okay. How are you feeling, sir? I'm getting really lightheaded. Can you open your eyes, sir? Sir. I don't have a pulse, do you have a pulse? Sure you don't feel a pulse? I don't feel a pulse. Sorry, I have a pulse. Okay, all right, can we start CPR? We were treating a patient for AFib and we used Cardizem and all of a sudden the entire bag emptied and he went hypotensive bradycardic and then he coded. Can we switch out that pump? We're gonna talk about what happened and what the security research component of this is. Essentially, this pump's firmware was reversed and was vulnerable to a variety of attacks that could do this exact thing. They give an advanced bolus of medication at a quick rate and cause a patient to have an adverse outcome. When you go back to work and you're in the emergency department and a sick patient comes in and you're hooking that patient up to all these monitors, these gadgets and gizmos, are you gonna think, think a second time about how reliant we are on these technologies and how if one of them should fail or be compromised, how it could impact not just the identity of your patients, but truly the life of your patients? I would definitely think about it. It would be devastating to the entire healthcare system if uh, things were hacked. So one call to action is read the task force report, please, and get your peers to read it. Two, show everybody the ABC Nightline video. And three, find some way to maybe get engaged uh, in some of the cavalry projects or some of these simulations. What we'd like to see is a 50 state initiative to do the CyberMed Summit or these tabletop exercises in your city. Okay, so, you know, as hospitals and medical equipment increasingly grow and networked internationally, the importance of security risk management for vulnerabilities has never been greater. There are many benefits to expanding connectivity among medical devices, but there are security and safety implications that come along with this. Ransomware and other types of attacks on medical devices can jeopardize patient safety, which is why it is imperative to uh, consider preventative controls. Uh, various security testing methods can be used. Uh, when scaling up detec detection and incident response for networked uh, medical devices. Medical device security is a matter of life and death. And as um, security professionals, we choose life. So let's get um, going with it. So why do we choose, uh, why do we highlight security so much with healthcare? To show the magnitude of this issue, since 2016, we see that 172 uh, ransomware attacks and counting have costed US health organizations more than $157 million. If you're going to take one thing from this webinar, um, it should be that human lives are at risk when hacking medical devices. As recent as September, a German patient passed away when ransomware infected her hospital systems, which could then not provide her life-saving treatment. Local authorities did in fact launch an investigation for murder, but uh, the cyber criminal will most likely not be caught. So before we talk medical devices, uh, I'm going to introduce, you, uh, introduce to you uh, what exactly is IoT. So the Internet of Things device industry has various sectors, especially with the consistent advancement of uh, networked computing globally. Industries have scaled up growth due to network uh, devices maximizing efficiency and uh, optimizing processes. So this is an amazing number. 50 billion devices will be connected to the Internet by 2030 globally. I wouldn't doubt if it's going to be more than that. Um, advanced network uh, devices can be used for malicious purposes, but also for beneficial purposes, like ensuring the future of the human race on Mars, for example. So what is a medical device? Let's get into that. Um, networked medical devices are a uh, category under IoT devices and act as one of the most impactful types in the world. During the COVID-19 pandemic, it is imperative to have capable devices like ventilators that function correctly to ensure that uh, patient health is prioritized. When considering the most critical aspects of medical devices, the technology safety and effectiveness are the main focuses. So these devices are intended to either diagnose, prevent, treat, or cure medical conditions or illnesses in humans and animals. Specific to uh, technological advancement, there are three different classifications when describing medical devices. 
Class one refers to low risk devices, which can be as simple as a bandage on your uh, hand or a wheelchair. Uh, class two considers uh, moderate risk devices, uh, such as needles or contact lenses. And finally, class three uh, references high risk devices, which includes pacemakers. Okay, so let's review some early regulations for medical uh, devices to gain a better understanding of uh, security risks. So in 1970, President Nixon uh, created the Cooper Committee, which claimed the need for detailed medical device legislation, including risk classifications. Six years later, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act was actually amended to uh, prioritize safety and effectiveness as focuses during a development. The three uh, risk classifications for medical devices were also formally introduced, which I uh, mentioned to you in the previous slide, with the FDA gaining more authority to take unsafe and ineffective devices off the market. So before advanced security considerations were needed, there were risk analysis procedures and regulation for medical devices. It is so important to improve upon these 1970s era uh, procedures with modern day adjustments. And that is why we see, uh, that's exactly what we see the FDA doing uh, present day. So one of the biggest threats to medical device effectiveness, as I mentioned, was which was one of the two focuses and uh, proper functionality, the other focus, is uh, security vulnerabilities. If a security vulnerability in a medical device is manipulated to provide hackers with confidential patient information, or the security vulnerability is exploited to alter the medical device's effectiveness, patient health and safety can be in uh, jeopardy. Readable plain text data can be encrypted into ciphertext, making the confidential data unreadable by an unauthorized third party. So we have some protocols, one being uh, TLS, Transport Layer Security, or uh, its predecessor, uh, Secure Sockets Layer, SSL. And these are used to encrypt HTTP traffic for web applications, which results in HTTPS. So basically, the TLS or SSL encapsulates the, encapsulates the HTTP packet, leading to uh, HTTPS. So when medical devices utilizing web applications are not using strong encryption, hackers can intercept confidential uh, information easier. Encryption uses various types of uh, uh, like methods, depending on um, depending on the device. So, with uh, modern day computer software being highly advanced, medical devices can use robust encryption methods to ensure data privacy. So let's talk ransomware. Patient data and health are equals uh, when talking about vulnerability protection. We want to ensure that both data and health are prioritized. Hackers can spread malicious software to expose confidential data, hold data hostage, or lock up medical uh, systems unless a ransom is compensated. So in the medical device industry, the more network uh, connected devices there are, the increased risk of ransomware exposure. So we have a, a direct correlation here. Um, inaccessible medical devices lead to delays, untreated patients, and millions of dollars. It might be billions, it might be nearing billions. Um, lost due to uh, delayed appointments, damaged device repair, and ransom payments. So this is a really uh, bad epidemic going on. So one example of um, a ransomware attack is um, on medical devices. It happened in 2017 when hospital workers in the United States were utilizing a um, MRI image quality medical device. This device uh, used an unpatched version of the uh, OS Microsoft Windows. And the system was locked up due to the WannaCry uh, ransomware that infected thousands of machines globally. This type of ransomware encrypted system files um, on the machine's secondary storage, also known it could be the hard drive, um, which would lock out the user unless compensation was actually given to the hackers to decrypt the files. And um, from through my research, I actually discovered that it was military grade um, encryption. So there was no way you're going through this unless you paid the ransom. Um, so this is a lesson for all computer users, <clears throat> not only medical device users, um, to consistently ensure that the technology being utilized is updated to the latest software that the manufacturer pushes out. So trust me, don't ignore Apple, don't ignore Microsoft. When they push out um, updates, it's for your safety, and especially if you're in the healthcare industry. Um, so operating systems like Windows and Mac OS regularly release software updates that repair vulnerabilities, like I said, um, that could lead to such an attack. So um, Windows publicly releases exploits in the form of uh, CVE, uh, which means common vulnerabilities and exposures. On GitHub, 
re researchers actually upload their findings to fix the vulnerabilities found in the CVE released by companies uh, like Microsoft. Um, it is both an, an organizational and community effort, CSMP community, um, to protect personal computers and medical devices against attacks by ransomware. So on average, I, I found this amazing to uh, you know include. There are actually 10 networked uh, medical devices per hospital bed. So it is clear that there is a lot of room for vulnerabilities in terms of security. So as mentioned in the um, introduction, safety and effectiveness play a large role in um, whether medical devices are deemed successful. The FDA emphasizes that this, this is a collaborative effort between medical device manufacturers and hospitals. The manufacturer, manufacturers should identify the security risks involved with the devices and hospitals should evaluate and protect their networks uh, accordingly. Both parties um, need to mitigate risks to ensure patient safety and device effectiveness. There are various methods to test for these vulnerabilities and weaknesses to achieve uh, security compliance. So in the past couple of years, the FDA has actually uh, begun to require a cybersecurity bill of materials uh, for devices, which lists all software and hardware components of devices that could be vulnerable, uh, vulnerable to attack. This enables engineers to protect the systems accordingly. So let's go through some facts and myths. Um, some may think security for medical devices is optional, but not surprisingly, it's not. It's required by the FDA for manufacturers to comply with uh, security regulations. Also, some may think that the process of updating pre uh, devices for security may be tedious, um, but the FDA highly encourages it and typically actually doesn't perform detailed review if the changes were solely uh, security related. So lastly, some may think the FDA tests device security, and this includes software changes for uh, just security. This task is purely up to the manufacturer to perform. So the United States has prominent regulations that protect patient records and um, information known as the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA. This helps maintain confidentiality, which is so essential for medical devices that can uh, process patient data. Compromised medical devices can lead to uh, cyber criminals decrypting patient personal information. There only needs to be one security uh, vulnerability for a hacker to get in. But think about it, the manufacturer has thousands of vulnerabilities to consider um, so that the hacker doesn't find that one. The design and manufacturing stages for medical devices are the most essential for security compliance. Uh, when devices hit open markets, users should still stay aware of possible risks they expose um, themselves to using, um, yeah, the, that they expose themselves while using the technology. So here we have some examples to emphasize the importance of HIPAA compliance during the uh, design and manufacturing stages for medical devices. In 2007, um, our own United States Vice President Dick Cheney had his pacemaker's wireless functionality disabled due to the uh, threat of cyber terrorism. If hacked into, this pacemaker's uh, functionalities could alter the patient's heart rhythms, leading to detrimental results. In 2019, 35 plus million individuals had their confidential records compromised due to uh, security breaches. It is crucial to find and fix any vulnerabilities in these devices to prevent these types of attacks. I'm just gonna take a quick water break. <laughs> okay, let's continue. So one may ask, why are risk considerations so essential when discussing uh, medical devices? Medical devices can be used in a life or death situation, and it should be the main focus of the users on the possible risks involved while using the technology. The two major types of risks when utilizing medical devices include security and safety risks. Security and safety risk management of the medical device computer systems is imperative for patient safety. Risk assessments include threat and vulnerability analysis to determine the chances that these uh, circumstances could occur um, and the extent of the impact if um, the, the vulnerability is exploited. So let's consider uh, the following. What is the probability of a vulnerability uh, being exploited? If a vulnerability is exploited, what is the impact? There will always be risk in everything that humans do. So it is possible to, uh, it is important to minimize risk as much as possible, but it is impossible to rule out vulnerability exploitation in medical device technology completely, no matter how uh, good the validation is. 
So security risks that uh, breach system security and reduce device safety and effectiveness are uh, need to be mitigated before the device is used on patients in real-time scenarios in medical treatment centers. <clears throat> Proper risk analysis um, of the system should be performed to evaluate and um, evaluate and identify any threats and vulnerabilities that could jeopardize sensitive uh, patient data and patient health. The security risk procedure includes beginning off searching for risks within the system. If a risk is found, it will be evaluated. So a control needs to be put in place to mitigate this risk. A control can be as simple as adding a um, authorized credentials um, within a software or something. So is security control be a safety risk? Safety risk analysis will also be performed to evaluate the uh, new security control. Note the safety impact of a uh, vulnerability being exploited. What will be lost or affected in the event that this vulnerability is exploited? So each new control within the medical device software infrastructure will reset the process of security and safety risk analysis until no more controls are needed. Okay, so here we have a scenario. Let's say we have a class three. So remember that's the highest risk type of medical device, such as a wireless infusion pump. This can be uh, connected to the hospital's network, allowing nurses to remotely control the amount of fluid being pumped into the patient. In this scenario, during the risk analysis process, an insecure open port for the network infusion pump was discovered. Consider that if the pumping rate or fluid volume are altered, the patient can face critical medical complications as a result. The security control could be to secure the open port using a uh, network or packet scanner, such as Wireshark. During the safety risk analysis, will the secure open port changes lead to a safety, uh, a safety risk, such as disabling an essential system within the infusion pump for patient safety? If there is a new safety risk, then a safety control will be put into place to resolve it within the software. Is there a new security risk due to the safety control? So this is an endless loop. I'm trying to you know, give you examples so you can kind of uh, comprehend what I'm saying in terms of it's an endless loop um, until all security and safety risks are considered and resolved with controls. This process is, is essential, especially for insecure uh, legacy devices, which means old devices, um, which could be as simple as a 1980s uh, blood pressure machine. So now we're gonna get into um, the more technical side of it. <clears throat> so here we have NMAP, which is short for Network Mapper. This tool can scan a network for ports, IP addresses, and MAC addresses of connected devices, key connected devices. Using this within Linux, the operating system, it can reveal the same information for medical devices that you would see with a laptop. Yes, the smartphone, the laptop, the iPad, whatever you are watching me currently on, that, that will show up the same in Nmap as a medical device. When a hacker gains access to a network and conducts a simple Nmap scan, they can search for susceptible devices such, a medical, such as a medical device and conduct a malicious attack based on their findings. So these scans will show open ports such as um, some of the Microsoft services within the red rectangle that I uh, included. So Nmap has other features too, including host discovery. Host discovery checks for port 80, which is HTTP and port 443, which is the encapsulated version of HTTP HTTPS um, with TLS to see if there are any active open ports being used by a connected device like a smartphone. If a hacker can search for live host information on a network, think about how dangerous this can be for hospital systems. So as I mentioned, this, this, even though this is through a laptop, this information, this could actually be pulled up within a hospital. So after discussing how medical devices are susceptible to hackers exploiting vulnerabilities, one may wonder, how a medical device manufacturer or researcher could discover these exploits before it falls into the wrong hands. A large part of securing medical IoT includes consistent testing, both before and after the device is uh, released to the open market. So let's go through some of these methods. The most prevalent security testing method is known as pen testing, penetration testing. Uh, this type of testing is when the manufacturer employs or provides permission to a security engineer uh, to discover any security vulnerabilities within the system that an, um, an attacker could actually um, exploit maliciously. So pen testing can be automated or done by a professional, as I said, a security engineer, and it includes auditing entire uh, computer systems, networks, and web applications. Pen testing is essential for medical devices because finding and securing any um, security vulnerabilities can save lives. It's that simple. 
resolving any security weaknesses, strengthening compliance with HIPAA regulations, and reporting all findings to the medical device manufacturer contributes greatly to the two goals of medical devices previously mentioned, safety and effectiveness. Hostable tools can be both free open source tools or premium tools. Instead of compensating an entire um, external organization to conduct tests, the internal engineers within the uh, organization um, host these softwares and conduct the pen tests themselves. So this is actually an interesting concept. Pen testing as a service or PTAAS is when an external organization conducts pen tests for uh, compensation rather than the internal engineers. Um, and pen testing as a service is a subcategory of software as a service, you may have heard. Next we have software weakness uh, testing. So another type of, uh, this is another type of security testing. Um, software engineers may focus on uh, the performance and overall user experience of their products um, rather than security. They're not security engineers, they're software engineers, right? So human program software is very susceptible to security flaws. A software weakness can be as simple as an uncalled function within a program leading to an offline firewall for a networked um, medical infusion pump. Hackers can exploit holes in the software, uh, which endangers patient health and data. By using automated software to iterate through code to find vulnerabilities, the risk of exploitation is lowered immensely. So next we have fuzzing. A fuzzer is, it's, I know it's a funny name, but <laughs> a fuzzer is a powerful automated uh, software testing tool in which there are random inputs provided for the program. Output, outputs are uh, carefully scanned to see if there are any code uh, vulnerabilities based on the response from the random data inputted. The input is key because with medical devices, inputs taken in a lot, think about it, for, especially for fluid dosages. And there's uh, numerous examples of why medical devices take input. Fuzzing is a very valuable testing method for this reason. And we have general uh, malware and virus testing which can uh, benefit a medical device's overall security simply by frequently scanning the system and responding appropriately if malicious software is discovered. An antivirus is a, uh, ut a utility software, such as a vast, um, and there's numer numerous out there, um, that looks for and eliminates viruses, trojans, worms, and other types of malware. Malware also means malicious software, if you weren't aware. Um, antiviruses use heuristic analysis to detect uh, malware, malicious software, by analyzing the characteristics and behavior of sus uh, suspicious files with following actions, including repairing, I know everybody hates this word, quarantining, and deleting. <clears throat> so, how you can make a difference. After viewing this presentation, if you feel that you want to join the security community in guarding healthcare, there are many opportunities out there. <clears throat> One organiz organization is called Cyber Volunteers 19. And it has a central mission of providing healthcare providers with, um, with sufficient security professionals to protect their infrastructure um, during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. By defending uh, hospitals, we hospital websites, networks, and devices against malware, viruses, and denial of service attacks, less disruptions will occur. Receiving security consulting and framework development by volunteers um, in the security industry immensely helps medical staff focus their attention on aiding um, their patients securely. That's the key. We want everybody to survive. So let the security professionals help out and medical uh, staff can do their job. So if you are part of the healthcare community and think the Cyber Volunteers 19 group uh, could be useful to your work site, check out their website and fill out a service request form. I'll make sure to post that in the chat. And lastly, if you would like to uh, help out uh, the healthcare community, but, but don't think you have the security skills, consider volunteering for a security nonprofit like CSMP uh, to start learning and teaching others. So we're gonna open up for questions. Uh, David, David Lee and I will be answering any that you may have. Thank you. Awesome job. Um, I see, this is Tony here, everybody with CSMP. Um, I have one question from Ian Gallop, and um, his question is, are ransomware attacks against hospitals primary, primarily done for financial purposes, or have there been APT-style nation-state attacks as well? David, do you want to grab this question? Well, I can take a stab at it. You know, I, I don't come from the, the medical field, but, you know, we, we have seen a spike in, in the news lately against US hospitals. 
during the COVID crisis. I, I would say it's it's a safe bet that most of those are financially motivated. I, I would say that typically is the trend statistically. If you look at the numbers and what tends to be the motivator is mostly financial. So if you had to close your eyes and throw a dart, mostly it's it's financially motivated. And you know what what's terrible is every time a company pays the ransom, um, they, they ultimately incentivize the, the cybercrime to continue. And you only have a small chance of actually receiving your data back. Uh, and they're not really, you know, they're criminals to begin with. They're not really required to, you know, uh, see through a data recovery process with you. So, um, you know, that's, that's always a, a sad thing is small companies don't know any better or, or uh, ill-informed organizations will, will end up paying the ransom. And it's just unfortunate that it con contributes to the cycle, unfortunately. Awesome. Thank you, David. We've got another question from Alexander. Um, and his question is, how can hospitals protect themselves with outdated yeah. hardware and software? Many are underfunded and unable to meet modern cybersecurity standards. Well, shoot. My answer is you have to fund your security programs. And we just have to take this seriously as a society. And I think we're, we're headed in that direction. I think general public awareness is improving about cybersecurity and its ramifications for things like hospitals. So we need to solve the problem of underfunding for sure. And we need to create programs that are as good in hospitals as, you know, midsize or better businesses, right? So there's no reason that hospitals should have to underfund security staffing. Um, and I, I wish my brother was here. He works in uh, operations for, for a hospital. He'd be like a great guest uh, to pair with your presentation, Logan. But, uh, you know, we need to solve this problem. We need to, to vote for change. Um, our elected leaders need to make an active role in helping solve this, this weak spot in our infrastructure. And organizations like CISA uh, at the federal level have been formed to, to help answer this problem of dealing with the outdated US cyber infrastructure and helping organizations try to be more resilient to the modern threats like ransomware. So really low security in this age is just, it's just unacceptable. not acceptable. And, you know, you, you don't have to be, you don't have to try to solve the problem overnight, but we have to take steps like at, at, at all levels, the, the hospital leadership um, and, you know, federal state, we got to do, we got to help out um, however we can, I think. I couldn't agree more. I, um, I think patient health and safety truly rides on um, security and it's underrated. Um, it really needs to, it's an urgent issue that needs to be, you know, um, highlighted across the country and across the world at that. Um, I, in my opinion, uh, some may disagree with me, but security in hospitals is as important as, um, you know, the medical devices function. Uh, if a medical device, um, is hacked and is unusable, then what's the purpose of even having the medical device at all? You know, so I think it should be implemented immensely within the FDA process and just uh, show more attention. Definitely. Great, great answer, guys. Thank you so much. We've got a third question coming in. Um, Nalima has asked, keeping aside sophisticated medical devices, can the hackers take over simple um, slash basic devices like weighing scales or any personal medical devices that work with the help of Android iOS apps? So um, a part of the process for uh, specifically um, safety risk analysis and just risk management in general, um, impact is weighed heavily, right? So um, to answer your question, let's consider the impact, right? If, um, a, if a weighing scale, there's not really much financial gain if um, hackers, I guess it's possible if hackers could get into it somehow, um, but there's not much impact for patient health or data. So um, 
hackers can take control of it, but would they though? Um, that's the question. I don't think so. Um, for something like an Android or iOS, iOS app, um, that might not jeopardize patient health, but it could jeopardize patient data. And I think um, iOS apps are usually secure, um, but I think anything's um, you know vulnerable if it's out there. So, um, so weighing scales, not so much, but for apps, um, patient data could definitely be in jeopardy. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we, have an, we have a couple other questions that came on in because of that. <laughs> well, that's always good, right? Yeah. Um, Khalid, um, his question is, are there any product certifications mandated by the um, government for medical devices for, say, testing for mitigation of known vulnerabilities, et cetera, just like we have safety certifications of electrical devices from UL, FM, et cetera? So I believe um, this, this could probably fit in through the FDA process. Um, the FDA, most likely, I don't have the exact uh, certification or um, yeah, certification um, number or name. But as I mentioned, FDA, the FDA is very strict in, uh, with cybersecurity and, and mandating it. So um, I, I believe I could look at the FDA's website and maybe get back to you on that. But I'm sure that uh, you know the federal government has requirements. And actually, um, through my research, I, I saw that the FDA has a cybersecurity lab. I, I thought that was pretty interesting. They use uh, fuzzing tools and malware um, detection um, softwares. So they definitely could you know require um, medical device security uh, compar comparable to what you mentioned for electrical devices. Yeah, Logan, I'll add to that that I've seen a couple other questions about what's being done to protect consumers and, and people from this threat. And I've been following this Senate bill that's been floating through um, the, the US government. And it looks like it was just passed by the Senate last month. And it's called the IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act of 2020. And I posted a link to that article uh, from November 25th, in case you missed that. And uh, that should catch you up on the what's being done at the federal level to try to curb this threat. Awesome. Great answer. Uh, that, could, David, would you be able to drop that link into the chat too as well? Uh, I just did. It should okay, be okay. Sorry. viewable by everybody. Okay, rock on. Okay, I'll, I'll continue with the questions. Um, Darius, um, his question is, could the hospital employees be considered a vulnerability to its security? If so, how can security professionals help keep the employees educated without them falling to phishing attempts that could lead to ransomware or compromised PI? Okay. So um, one of the most powerful security vulnerabilities is actually humans. I'm sorry. I know we're all humans here. I'm not a robot, I swear. Um, but humans are the most you know, vulnerable uh, thing in regards to security. And this is where social engineering comes into play. Um, so yes, hospital employees uh, simply leaking passwords to secure databases, that's a big vulnerability with uh, security. Um, so how can sec uh, security professionals help keep employees educated? This is uh, along with what David was mentioning. Um, we really need to see an uptick with uh, uh, funding for security within hospitals, uh, especially for education. And also, if you work in a hospital, attending events such as these to edu personally educate yourself. So you can maybe tell a peer, hey, let's not, you know, post the password to Facebook or something like that. You know, it's uh, important to stay educated. So uh, just you participating in this uh, webinar, you're on the right track for helping the, the cause for um, securing hospitals. Yeah, I'll add to that, that I, I think the way that we hire and employ people and grant them access is a little bit broken these days, because, you know, once you're inside of an organization, there's that trust level. And I think the better that we manage that trust level to reflect the fact that you might be a new hire and maybe you don't understand the policies, maybe you haven't gone through some training, the more that we can restrict access and pull back on the trust level until that gets addressed. But for each employee, I think that's going to help deal with insider threat, for example, uh, for employees that abuse the trust that you give them as an organization to, to exploit your uh, security 
uh, vulnerabilities. So there's that angle of it too. Great stuff, guys. Okay. We have a handful more questions too coming on in. Um, Kevin has asked, what are your thoughts on health agencies beginning to leverage cloud technologies and the risk from a security perspective? Are they better or worse off taking this route? So with uh, cl cloud in general, cloud technologies, there's luckily there's a big industry for uh, cloud security. Our very own uh, R&D director, Eric Evans works with uh, cloud security. So honestly, um, cloud technologies are a great uh, method for, you know, being with health agencies. Um, Eric, uh, David, do you want to add anything? I would just add that that's an infrastructure question and n hospitals are notorious for outdated infrastructure in the US especially. So I think if you're close to this field, if you're if you have some influence over hospital systems, uh, um, do your part to modernize as much as possible and if if you're having trouble selling your company on whether you should adopt cloud, I would add that cloud has become a competitive differentiator for many businesses as it's just more elastic, more versatile, um, more agile than your monolithic uh, on-prem servers. So that's always a consideration from the business point of view. Uh, you know, healthcare is different. So um, that's, it's, that's its own problem. I think it's just modernizing healthcare. Awesome guys. Um, we did have another question come in Q&A, but I also just want to give um, some spot, shine some light on some of the questions that we got in chat. So um, Francis had asked, is there a greater tendency away from the cloud for medical systems such as surgery systems to reduce risk and network outage, but doesn't this increase security issues for IoT in the long term? So I believe with you know increased connectivity, there's always going to be um, an increase in security issues. There's just it's a direct correlation. So um, to answer your question in a simple answer, yes, um, security issues for IoT will will occur in the long term if that's the case. Um, but that's kind of where you need to weigh: um, Are you getting more out of uh, medical devices versus? What are you losing with uh, security risks? So um, that's what I have for that. Okay, thanks, Logan. Appreciate it. Um, and then another question um, in the chat was from Nicholas, and he was wondering um, what is being done in the industry to improve IoT security. Are there any unique attacks that have been specifically created for IoT devices? So yeah, did you can... did you want that, Logan? Go for it. I could just, uh, I have like a quick, not necessarily like a mini story about it, and then you could uh, finish it off. So um, actually, there are a lot of, um, not many, but I, I started to look into GitHub. And there's actually some interesting tools that are uh, being made for IoT security. So it's a pen testing tool specifically for I IoT. Um, so you'll see, you see the free and open source community making a big difference in making these tools specifically for IoT, because a lot of, um, the pen testing tools out there, such as uh, you know Burp Suite, for example, they're they're made for web applications. So now we're seeing a big uh, strive from the free and open source community for IoT uh, devices and security. Yeah, I posted a link in the chat to an article that explains the 2016 Mirai botnet. If you've never heard of this thing, it was a monster. So this thing was able to reproduce itself by using default credentials on IoT devices. And this thing swept through, uh, I believe it was heavy in Europe, Asia, US, and it was able to then DDoS key parts of the internet backbone, um, taking down services like Netflix, Facebook, and uh, strategically capable of focus firing against critical uh, internet targets. So, uh, you know, if you control that many hosts on the internet, then you're able to basically use them all as a giant ray gun to disrupt your target. And so that that's the biggest IoT like security event that that I've studied. 
so far as the Mirai botnet. But um, I, I think our awareness of IoT has gradually, uh, well, I guess quickly improved <laughs> since then, since we've had to learn the hard way, right? So check that out. Check that out if you've never heard of it. Great stuff. Thank you so much, David and Logan. Um, and then I think our last question that rolled on in through Q&A, it's th um, Rafi had a question about, can we interface a device um, hardware security in front of the equipment that can disable the equipment from the network if a threat is detected? David, do you want to grab this one? Um, I will say the, the threat detection techniques that we're using these days, um, you know, I see a lot of adoption of uh, intrusion detection systems. I think that's where you're going with that. So things like Suricata, uh, things that are that come bundled with Security Onion. So whether we can automate the response of uh, to a detection, yes, we you can automate um, some responses to detection. When it comes to the medical field, that's where I'm less. I'd less be able to speak to specific medical devices, but generally speaking, yes, you can you can embed automation in your defenses to respond to certain threat detections, if that makes sense. And, and that's a big focus of our industry these days is how do we automate all those tedious little things so that our security personnel can focus on big incidents and big threats like APTs. And um in regards to the IDS, actually, um, through my research, I saw that um, a lot of them don't actually respond themselves, but they generate reports to then give to the, uh, I guess you could say, medical um, manufacturer or hospital. So a lot of IDS is just, uh, they kind of have a, um, a copy of what typical network traffic would look like, network flow. And uh, for example, if, um, it's irregular to see a port 80, which is uh, HTTP and port 443 HTTPS uh, consistently be um, flowed through the network. And that might uh, trigger an IDS uh, thinking that, you know, someone might be um, searching for or trying to track um, HTTP traffic. So um, it, it might not be able to disable the equipment, but it, it will definitely generate reports uh, in regards to the IDS. That's what I'm talking about. Thank you. Awesome. Um, thank you guys so much. I think that's pretty much it um, on our questions portions, unless anybody, oh wait, I spoke too soon. Um, <laughs> that always happens with me. Okay, so anonymous attendee, um, he had a question. Um, so <laughs> his, his question is, his my bottle of painkiller has an expiration date on it culturally and legally why is it acceptable to use outdated out of support or uncertified medical devices in medical settings well in regards to your uh expired bottle of uh, painkillers i believe you should consult your doctor um with using such a medicine um not necessarily us um because the doctor has your best interest um but i guess in terms of security, um, and we'll kind of you know leave the painkillers out of it. In terms of security, using legacy devices or outdated software, um, it can turn bad because without updates, you know, I, I kind of emphasize that it, even for your phone, right? You need to, you really need to update things because the manufacturers are trying to help you. Uh, you know, Apple, Microsoft, they're always trying to push out updates to help you. So especially for medical devices, um, you know, hospitals really need to uh, prioritize updates for their uh, firmware and software so that, um, you know, outdated things don't get uh, exploited. Yeah, and I'll, I'll even play devil's advocate, Logan. Um, on the other side of the coin from an operational, uh, you know, org operational sustainability perspective. And when, when I was working in manufacturing, we had production machinery that we were not allowed to update by the vendor. And these, these machines were running deliberately outdated software. And it, it, it's because of the customized applications uh, that control the machines depend on the consistency and the, the known state of the, the, operating system below it, right? So uh, 
updates are the answer for the security professional, but they're seldom the answer for the operational oversight of an organization. And that's where uh, change management has to show up and figure out how do we how do we win win? Like how do we update systems and protect ourselves, or do we have to think of different defenses for systems that we just are not allowed to update because the vendor needs those systems to be that way, right? And that was a frequent occurrence in, in manufacturing at least. So awesome. Well, um, I think that was that was pretty much it on our questions. Unless um, anybody else have anything else that they, they wanted to add, or any closing statements by you two? Sure. Um, so I'm glad I could uh, spend this time with you all. Uh, feel free to re reach out to me with any questions. Um, and I thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, evening, and I hope you all stay uh, safe and healthy. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we've got our Wednesday webinar uh, tomorrow evening. And it's going to be a roadmap to becoming a pen tester. So if you feel like offensive security is in your future, perhaps, and you're curious the training path to take to get there, uh, that's our webinar uh, coming right up tomorrow night. So check that out. I posted a link in the chat, but that was toward the top of the uh, webinar today. Mm. But yeah, thanks for joining everybody. Good to see you.